Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Bible Doctrine Breakdown. As of this recording, the Canadian federal election is just six days away, and the United States 2020 presidential election is one year away, almost to the date. So at this point in time, what I wanted to do was just take a few minutes to discuss the idea of voting in elections. For Jehovah's Witnesses, this is something that they do not do, and this is something that they are well known for not doing. So what we're going to discuss is their reasons for not voting, and I'm going to debunk each and every one of those reasons. So let's get started. Before we begin with Watchtower's six reasons for not voting in an election, I just want to give you my own personal thoughts on this. Now of course, in Canada and in the United States, voting is optional. You can decide whether or not you want to participate. In other parts of the world, it is compulsory, even to the point of facing jail time or hefty fines for not voting. So I'm going to focus on Canada's election, especially just because it's a few days away. Being brought up a Jehovah's Witness, of course I didn't participate in any kind of votes, whether they be city, provincial, federal, you name it, strictly neutral. That's the policy of Jehovah's Witnesses everywhere. As a former Jehovah's Witness, it took me a little while to come around to the idea of actually voting in an election because I'd never done it before. I didn't feel educated enough to make an informed decision. That changed. <laughs> and my encouragement to everyone viewing this, whether you are a Jehovah's Witness or an ex-Jehovah's Witness or never were, and maybe you're just thinking, well, what's the point in voting? I want you to consider the idea. Would you want somebody else to do this to you in a buffet restaurant. Naturally, you wouldn't stand there and just watch people piling onto your plate things you didn't want and smile. That just seems kind of ridiculous, don't you think? Who would want to just give others that kind of power over their lives? Well, by not speaking up, by not casting a vote, that is essentially what you're doing. Now, this video isn't meant to pressure people into voting. You need to do what's right for you. But when it comes to the idea of voting for a political ruler, for some former witnesses, this may feel like a bad taste in your mouth, like, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. But I want you to look at it like this. Think of every country in the world as a business and the business has a president, vice president, you name it. They have certain ways of doing business with other businesses and they also have policies and procedures in place for managing their employees. So what does a government have? Well, Canada's government has a prime minister, AKA president, if you're from the United States, and they are kind of in charge of the whole government as it were. And they have people that work for them to further the agenda as to what they want to do, where they want to take the business, what kind of relationships they want to have with other countries or other economies and businesses really in the end, and what their policies are going to be for how their employees, or in this case, politically speaking, their constituents are going to relate to them. So really, is there, is there any difference? whether it be laws passed by a government or policies passed by the company that you work for, or if you're self-employed, policies that you set for yourself, is voting in an election really all that different than choosing who your next employer is going to be? Not when you put it in that light, at least not in my opinion. But now Watchtower likes to use the expression well, Jesus' followers are supposed to be no part of this world, which means they remain strictly neutral and so on and so forth. Well, if they are no part of the world, 
then really there should be no interaction with the commercial aspect of the world, don't you think? Shouldn't they be all in one giant compound somewhere, entirely self-sustained, not purchasing any goods from anywhere else? Just something to think about. But Watchtower, as a corporation, is very much a part of this world. They have business dealings with all kinds of suppliers, like where they get their paper, their supply of leather for all of their books, the, the ink that is used to actually print the physical copies of books that they have. They are propping up some other, some other company. And in some cases, depending upon where that product comes from, they are contributing to another country's economy by buying their products. So are they really no part of the world? What about if you are investing in the stock market? Well, wait, Watchtower does that too. They have investments all over the place and it's so easy to find them. Investments in things like Disney, Lockheed Martin, which makes weapons of war. Um, in some companies that even make soft pornography, they've had holdings in. Are they no part of the world? No, they're very much participating in it. And considering the fact that Russia is having a ban on Jehovah's Witnesses and Watchtower is encouraging witnesses to write letters begging for the Russian government to go easy and reduce their restrictions, are you not then appealing to the political machine and taking part in affirmative action? That sounds like taking part in this world, don't you think? But let's consider the six points that Watchtower shows. So I'll bring them up on screen and then we can discuss them. So the article that we're going to take a look at is on JW.org and it is from the Keep Yourselves in God's Love book in the appendix under Flag Salute Voting and Civilian Service. Now, granted, this particular book is no longer in active use. I believe it has been replaced by another, but the principles are very much considered current, especially because when I went to JW.org and just did a search on voting, keep yourselves in God's love is the first result after some scriptures. So obviously Watchtower considers this information pertinent to the discussion. So let's go down to the subject on voting. So it talks here about voting in political elections and mentions that Christians, sorry, true Christians, respect the right of others to vote and that they don't campaign against elections and cooperate with elected authorities. I know what you're thinking. That discussion about cooperating with elected authorities, that's a whole other ball of wax. But let's look really closely at why they stay neutral in political elections. And there are six principles. So let's just zoom in on that part of the discussion. First of all, number one, Jesus followers are no part of the world. And it uses John 15 verse 19, which reads, if you were part of the world, the world would be fond of what is its own. Now, because you are no part of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. For this reason, the world hates you. Well, being no part of the world, let's take that in its historical context. Basically, the world in which Jesus lived and his followers lived was full of strife. It had a lot of um, political movements and everything that were rebelling against the uh, Roman authorities of the time. You had factions that were fighting amongst themselves and trying to reclaim the um, the throne in, in Judea and, and such. So this really, in my opinion, Jesus was talking about these kinds of struggles that his followers wouldn't be a part of. They wouldn't get wrapped up in all of these different um, political struggles and uh, activism that was violent. That's what Jesus didn't want his followers being a part of. So this scripture to me doesn't really hold up very well for not voting in an election. 
uh, at least, you know, if you're trying to say, like, this is all about uh, Christian neutrality and such. Because, again, being no part of the world, that would mean that you shouldn't be partaking in any part of it. Jesus didn't say here something about not being part of the political world. He said, no part of the world, period. Well, that just doesn't hold up. That just wouldn't, that wouldn't happen. Especially because later on, in his prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus spoke about the idea of his followers. You can't take them out of the world, but to just watch over them while they're in the world. So this would be a contradiction. Number two, Christians represent Christ and his kingdom. And they point out these verses here about how, um, Jesus saying that his kingdom is no part of the world and that if it was that his attendants would have fought so they shouldn't be handed over to the Jews when being uh, brought to trial. Well, again, the thing is, consider what the belief is from Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus had a kingdom, it just wasn't earthly. So does that really mean that if you are trying to say choose a certain elected official to look after you while you are still on earth that you are rejecting jesus and his kingdom no like again using watchtowers theology this is basically pointing to the idea that okay they're not going to try and set up a government of their own and they are going to preach to others about the kingdom but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't have any kind of say in what kind of ruler they're going to have over them that they're paying taxes to. Paul's verse here, and you know how I feel about the Apostle Paul, he talks about being ambassadors substituting for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. As substitutes for Christ, we beg, become reconciled to God. What does that have to do with voting in an election? Absolutely nothing. Someone can be reconciled to God, as it were, and still say, well, that guy is going to tax me less than the other guy, so I would like to pay less taxes, thanks. I'd like him to be in power. Is that substituting for Christ or God? No, it's basically saying, I just want to pay less taxes. Nothing wrong with that. So this argument also really doesn't hold water. The third one about the Christian con congregation being united in belief and members bound together by Christ-like love. Again, here we are back in Paul's writings. I urge you brothers that you should speak in agreement and that there should be no divisions among you, but you may be completely united in the same mind and in the same line of thought. So, I mean, what Paul is really saying here is you shouldn't be like arguing a whole bunch amongst each other. Okay, that's fine. We can have friendships and even like be family with people that have differing political beliefs than us. It doesn't mean that we could only think along the same lines as those around us or that they should all have to think our way. This is destructive. This leads to nothing but an echo chamber of potentially bad ideas and has demonstrably pr been proven to cause exactly that. So I don't feel honestly that this scripture holds up at all with regards to not participating in an election. And another one of Paul's golden nuggets in another letter, clothe yourselves with love for it is a perfect bond of union. Having the same political beliefs or ideals is not a predicate for having love for other people. I like to think of myself as a bit of a liberal, but I have very close relationships with people that are conservatives. It is not dependent on being in the same political spectrum or the same spot in the political spectrum to have love for somebody. So this too really falls flat. Number four, those who elect a certain official share responsibility for what he does. 
and then it has principles uh, recorded here. 1 Samuel 8 verse 5 uh, talks about like your sons are not walking in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And then in later verses, <laughs> later verses, what we really have here is when the when the ancient Israelites are asking, like, can we please have a king just like all of the other nations? After all, we are a nation. Can we have a king here? Jehovah, the narcissist, goes on about the idea, well, okay, this is what the king is going to do to you. And, you know, whatever, whatever he says, you have to do, and I will hold you responsible for that. In verse 18, it says, The day will come when you will cry out because of the king you have chosen for yourselves, but Jehovah will not answer you in that day. This really falls apart because the Israelites had no say in who was going to be their king. It was all based upon the idea of a predetermined bloodline. That's all it was. So they didn't choose a king. Jehovah decided who the king was going to be at the start and which family it was going to be in. And that was the end of that. And really, this whole business of, well, I'm not going to answer you when you call out to me and ask for help. This just really becomes a case of, I told you so. But in the end, as you read on, Jehovah gave guidelines for a king. He would bless certain kings, like, for instance, giving Solomon a whole bunch of wisdom and riches. So Jehovah was meddling in political affairs of the day to begin with. So this doesn't hold up whatsoever. And then in 1 Timothy 5, verse 22, another one of Paul's golden nuggets, he says, Never lay your hands hastily on any man, neither become a sharer in the sins of others. Keep yourself chaste. What does this have to do with sharing responsibility for what somebody else does? Don't become a sharer in the sins of others. Paul even has a separating thought here. Never lay your hands hastily on any man. In other words, don't be appointing officials or elders in the congregation, really, prematurely because you're desperate to have an elder. That's what that boils down to. But there's a separate thought here. Neither become a sharer in the sins of others. It's not saying that one leads to the other. They are separate thoughts. So no, Watchtower, this falls flat on its face as well. This is not sound reasoning. Number five, Jehovah viewed Israel's desire for a visible ruler as a sign that they had rejected him. 1 Samuel 8 verse 7, Jehovah said to Samuel, Listen to everything the people say to you, for it is not you whom they have rejected, but it is I whom they have rejected as their king. Again, I have to go back and say, to me, this is a narcissistic scripture, really because the people were not rejecting Jehovah as their king. They wanted someone ruling on earth that they could see and that they could have just like all of the other nations to basically legitimize them as a nation to be dealt with in amongst all kinds of other nations that all had kings. That's all this is. And if the sovereign of the universe has such a fragile ego that people wanting to have a visible king so that they can interact with the other nations around them is a rejection of him, well, wow, you're really easily having your ego bruised there, Jehovah. Get over yourself. Lastly, Christians must have freeness of speech when speaking to people of all political persuasions about God's kingdom government. And we have scriptures that are very familiar about the good news of the kingdom being preached. Or Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them the things I have commanded you. Hebrews 10, 35. Do not throw away your boldness, which will be richly rewarded. Well, here the footnote says, freeness of speech. 
I don't see how you are throwing away any freeness of speech when if you want to be a quote kingdom proclaimer and you want to tell people all about the kingdom of God there is nothing that you are throwing away your freeness of speech on if you have a political persuasion on earth if you are waiting for God's kingdom to supposedly come and take over and everything else okay you're sitting back and you're waiting and you're not doing anything you're not taking part in anything. If you are really waiting for God's kingdom to fix everything, you are taking yourself right out of society, probably living on a plantation somewhere, <laughs> and being entirely self-sufficient. I'm going to go back to another point. In verse four, or in point number four, when it says that those who elect a certain official share responsibility for what he does, Okay, so does that mean then that whenever we are paying our taxes that we are sharing responsibility in what in what that money is being used for? Well, to a certain degree, some may feel that way. But that's not always the case. It's not like we have a specific choice in where every single dollar goes. But that didn't stop, say, Paul from saying, pay back Caesar's things to Caesar, that also didn't stop Jesus from saying that you need to pay back Caesar's things to Caesar and God's things to God. Jesus didn't say here that voting for any political party was going to be taking anything away from God. They didn't have democracy back then. It was a dictatorship. So again, Watchtower, you're falling back on scriptures that have no practical application in today's society. And this whole reasoning about staying neutral and not voting falls flat. So in light of all of that information, I want you to consider the idea. Voting? Is it really so wrong? Is Watchtower pushing their own agenda as far as voting goes? Or are they really concerned about Christian neutrality as they speak? You have to decide for yourself. In the end, stop, think. Are you letting somebody else pile onto your plate their preferences and just standing back and letting it happen? Is that really how you would eat your meal? something to think about. I encourage everyone, get out there, vote, speak your piece. Even if you are not overly thrilled with the candidate that is leading the political party or representing you, at least have your say. If your candidate wins, great, the person you asked for, they're in, they're in office now. If somebody that you didn't want to wins, at least you can go to bed at night knowing you did your part to try and prevent it. At any rate, keep those thinking caps on and be sure to think for yourself before you let others decide for you. you, you out to me.